you know, you've studied the, the tech game extensively and you've met a lot of people. Is there anything where, where our people, African-Americans, uh, we're late to the party in terms of the tech game, relatively speaking, right? We're getting into the game just now. Is there something that you feel like the, entrep- the black entrepreneurs that you come in contact with, there's something specific with the black entrepreneurs I meet where they struggle with specific things uh, and kind of there's some specific areas uh, related to this late party to the game where we need to step it up. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't even want to add any sort of weight to like any sort of criticism other people give, you know, black entrepreneurs. I think um, uh, the, the things that we struggle with or entrepreneurs struggle with. And, you know, it's some of that for us is not because like, you know, we we just struggle with it. It's because we weren't exposed to it. We don't have resources there. Obviously, raising money is a very difficult experience for black entrepreneurs, even harder for black women. You know, being able um, uh, to get deals done sometimes, even and even when it makes sense and it's the right deal for a company to do, is hard. Our brand to do is hard for black entrepreneurs. Um, but look, I think, you know, we, we have to continue to just work together, band together and, um, and, you know, work hard at like whatever we're doing and like support each other in that process. And I think, you know, this community of black entrepreneurs, especially in today's time, like that's, that's what, you know, I've noticed we've all done. And, and I'm happy that there are more entrepreneurs, like uh, and investors, entrepreneurs turned investors and investors, um, like yourself, um, who support, you know, black entrepreneurship, um, and, you know, are there to sort of push down doors for black entrepreneurs to walk through them. And so, um, uh, what I will say is that, um, uh, there's been a bunch of times where black entrepreneurs have been early to the prop, the, the party and haven't gotten credit for it. Um, uh, you look at what Deshaun has done with Maven and, um, and, you know, in the black beauty space, uh, in the beauty space in general, but even in the black beauty space, um, you know, uh, you know, turn in, um, stylists into, um, uh, like creating new gener- uh, new revenue lines for stylists to be able to sell, you know, uh, weave extensions and, and even additional beauty products and, you know, how massive that company has gotten and, you know, not enough people talk about it. When you look at um, Michael McGee and Neil Silas Griffin, who literally started it's, this entire, there was this moment in time where there was this big wave around ed tech startups, specifically startups that were teaching people how to code in three or four months. Like that wasn't started by General Assembly. That was started by uh, Code Academy, which became Starter League because uh, the YC startup Code Academy took their name, and so they had to change their name to Starter League in Chicago by two black guys that went to Northwestern. They started the. They were the first company that ever started a program to teach people how to code in three months, and they were doing Ruby on Rails, and uh, and they didn't even know how to code themselves, but they ended up finding an instructor. They went through. They got an incredible story. They went finding an instructor getting that person to build curriculum the first three months. And then they put up a website, got like 70 people to pay them eight grand or something like that up front um, to like build this school to teach people how to code. And, you know, they were in the classes themselves for the first, you know, three months learning themselves. And, uh, and over time that company continued to grow and Jason Freed and the 37 signals now Basecamp team uh, who created Ruby on rails. They invested in these guys, uh, which was like their first outside investment. And they grew an entire, you know, ecosystem and they don't get credit for it. Like people give general assembly credit and they give dev bootcamp and all of the, uh, hack reactor, all of these guys credit for like, you know, uh, uh creating that ed tech movement around teaching people how to code, but those was two black kids um, in Chicago. Did you pitch investors and raise capital for any of your companies yourself? First company, no. Um, we are profitable because we started throwing parties day one and then we use that money to build the tech. Um, the second company, Growth Hackers, um, raised about $7 million. Um, but that company... I had co-founders. So the other three companies, I didn't have co-founders. That company, I had co-founders, white male co-founders, right? Two white male co-founders, which made raising capital a lot easier, especially because one of them being famous within the Silicon Valley world. Third company, Millicent's, was a marketing firm, didn't raise any capital for that. And then the fourth company, Pop Social, actually pitched it to a couple investors, got shot down right away. I'm a... that type of stuff puts a chip on my shoulder. I don't have time for it. I'm like, look, I'm just going to put my own capital, you know, hire my own team, take money out of my own account to build the tech, invest hundreds like, not of thousands of dollars to out here begging. No, you know, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to beg for you. I know how profitable this could be. And, you know, in two years now, we're an eight figure company. Right. Yeah. And highly profitable. So right? you took a lot of risks. I took a lot. Uh, of and, and that's that's what you see. 
uh, with a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs. The for for example, Elon Musk. You know, he cashes out of uh, PayPal, uh, and he puts his entire net worth on very risky bets. He bets on himself, and as you know, uh, Tesla was about to file for uh, bankruptcy um, right before they got a uh, a federal loan, uh, and of course, the rest is history. Uh, but your your experience where you're betting on yourself, you, you first say, hey, I want to diversify my risk, I want to get investors. The process starts to seem funny, like, hey, this is just not me. It's yeah. like, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not out here yeah. kind of, you know, going, flying across the country, pitching these type of people. Right, right. And how many investors uh, until you, you got to that point where like- It only took me, I think, for Pop Social, two or three investors. To, for it, me, like just seeing the feedback and the feedback was kind of the same. They're not going to get it. They're, they're not going to get it. They're not going to get it. And so um, the feedback was was the same. And I just realized, like, I, I'm not I'm not for this. Yeah, I thought you, you essentially I could I could relate to that. Just you're not built to I'm not built to be for trying it. to explain I'm a, everything. I'm going I'm to make it. I'm going to make it on my own in, in, in two yeah. years and two years in terms of just capital is the most successful company I've started. And that's just in two years. The trajectory that we're on could be a lot bigger in three to four years, right? And we're profitable. We're good. We don't need any investors. Um, we're in a good place. But they would have saw a really nice return on their money. I knew with my audience, I knew with my understanding of people and what they want, who the hell doesn't want more followers? Who the hell doesn't want to build their audiences and get more engagement and things like that? People naturally want these things. Brands naturally want these things, right? And this was an affordable option to spending thousands of dollars on Facebook ads or thousands of dollars on a marketing firm. I understood that. You know, sometimes people don't see the picture. I'm actually in the process of of uh, starting two new companies, uh, one of which I'm going to bootstrap. The other, I'm not sure because it's going to be uh, capital intensive. Um, and so just the idea of I might actually have to play that game is, is what, yeah. What do you great. say? You got a big check from Intel. Yeah. Uh, describe that process, uh, for our audience. Yeah. You know, what I, year was that in? That was in 2015. So in uh, 2015, we raised uh, $10 million led by Intel capital. Um, I mean, it's a process. If, if you ever raised a uh, round, you know, you got to go through diligence. And, and diligence is an uh, uh, example of, like, someone walking in your room and, like, digging through your closet, right? <laughs> did, did they do a thorough uh, background investigation on you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think every round, not just Intel, right? I think every, every investor that's pretty much given me a dollar has done a thorough background you know, they're looking at all your financials. They're looking at all your, you know, they're trying but, to. But personally, they're, they're really digging into Rodney in terms of, uh, you know, your credit and stuff like that. You went through a thorough background investigation. Yes. Yeah. So some of the folks out there, uh, when you're going through deep DD, I know a lot of us have paranoia like, hey, man, am, am I getting uh, a black tax? <laughs> uh, would you uh, do you believe a black tax is there in terms of a VC or investment due diligence where, hey, I'm going to check these black folks out just a little bit more, or maybe a lot more. You know, I, I don't so. see these motherfuckers a lot. I hope so. Right. You know, I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I'm an investor now. And uh, I tend to, when I meet a founder, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mitigating my risk. So the, the only reason why I tend to invest in things that are familiar with me is because I know it, right? So yeah. when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when a white investor... Uh, meets uh, a black founder that he may like. This is very new for him. He doesn't necessarily know much about him, his environment, who he's from. So I think it's only right that that, that person does a thorough check. And now, I, I think as the founder on the other end, it's it's only right that I get myself together if this is what I'm trying to do. Out so it would be justified for a, a VC or angel investor to apply heavier due diligence, more thorough due diligence on a black founder because I don't see you guys enough on, to feel on, comfortable. Yeah, on any founder he doesn't feel comfortable with. So if the data said, hey, the firm goes deeper on uh, black founders in terms of uh, background checks. Yeah. Is that a problem for you? No. Okay. If I, if I met a founder from um, Russia, guess who's going to go super deep? Because I feel like Russia be doing a lot of things wrong. And that's just, you, that's my stereotype. But, but that's are you co- saying black founders are doing a lot of things wrong? I'm saying, I, mean, I literally, and I, I literally, we, we had a customer from Russia 
a well-known, respectable company, and we did diligence before we made them customers. Okay. Because it's, it's a high risk. All Russian companies are high risk. But you're comparing I'm saying, your people here in the United States, at least, to Russians. Uh, a lot of corruption, a lot of fraud. You know, why would you compare us to Russians? I'm not comparing us to Russians. I'm saying that, I think that the, the, the clear statement is that I'm saying is that if I'm uncomfortable with something, I'm going to do a lot of diligence. But the, the premise is I'm he, more uncomfortable with black folks because... I don't know black folks. You don't know black folks. Okay, so would you be okay if... Black people need a higher FICO score uh, with with the, with the lender. Uh, so the, black I, folks need a seven hundred. White folks need six fifty. Would that be okay? No, that wouldn't be okay. 